present to us today. Um, and this is um, this is the team from McKinsey that has actually been a partner for us for many years now already. Um, before I, I, I talk a little bit about the, the individuals, let me just say why I think it's such an important thing to have uh, an institution like McKinsey involved in micromobility. Uh, you have to appreciate that this took a lot of courage. Um, um, McKinsey is a company that works, it is a premier management consulting company and works with a very large clients typically, and um, they are usually um, quite an expensive uh, outfit to to hire. And um, and for that reason, um, they don't uh, they, they don't waste their time. Uh, so to see to see them devoted uh, as much as they have been to micromobility uh, indicates uh, either that they're really smart or uh, that they really see something or both, I should say. Um, they see something in this. Um, and, and for that, I'm very grateful and thankful uh, that they actually um, uh, have devoted so much energy and effort to, uh, to, this, uh, to this industry um, and essentially have defined it by their, uh, by their research. Um, so um, let me uh, just introduce the speakers. Um, Kirsten Heineke, um, uh, well, he's, uh, he's actually a, a veteran, a, a long-term veteran and partner at McKinsey. He's co-founded and co-led a team, uh, or rather a, a sort of a center, as they call it, uh, uh, for future mobility, which consists of over 200 experts from uh, across the world working in McKinsey, including 40 professionals authoring specifically market research uh, uh, forecasts of consumer uh, preferences, uh, behaviors, uh, uh, impact on global networks, uh, value networks, um, uh, the adoption curves, the uh, and externalities such as emissions. Um, so that means not only does he have his personal expertise bringing to bear here, but we also have a tremendous team behind him. Um, and also joining him will be uh, Darius Skurtu. Um, he's also the co-leader of the McKinsey Mo Micromobility Initiative within the Center of Future Mobility at McKinsey. Um, their work together um, has been serving clients within McKinsey, uh, but let's, you know, I mentioned the large size of typical clients, but this group, this effort is actually also focusing on entrants, startups, disruptors, um, uh, and everything in between, um, and even investors. Uh, so they're, they're also global, uh, they're not looking at any one region, as you'll see in the data today, but uh, they're, they're, uh, they're probably the best team today looking at uh, the market uh, for micromobility. Uh, and um, uh, I'm very gratified that they're joining us today and we'll get a chance to have a conversation later. So let's begin with, uh, with, uh, with, with uh, Kirsten and Darius. Horace, thanks so much for the intro and for the kind words. It's always a big pleasure being part of this uh, fantastic group of micromobility enthusiasts. And uh, yes, we can say that we are highly committed to it. For those of you that have been following me on LinkedIn, uh, I think I'd make it public that I not only talk about micromobility, but I'm quote unquote trying to eat my own dog food. So I got rid of my personal vehicle. I'm only doing shared mobility and I'm a vivid fan, avid fan of micromobility for me specifically it's scooters actually. So I commute to the office by e-kick scooter every single morning and try to use uh, shared micromobility as much as possible for every single trip. And whenever it's raining outside, um, I'm usually struggling between getting wet or actually um, uh, uh, using something else. And it's mostly the getting wet part because I have to admit that I'm drawing a lot of satisfaction from uh, using micromobility over any kind of other service simply because it's it's just a different quality of life. Um, we I was going to open up with an <clears throat> sorry with an intro of Darius and myself. I don't think we need that anymore. Thanks for that, Horace. Um, I was also going to open up a bit with what we do in the Center for Future Mobility. Horace covered a lot of this, but basically it is our institution to be serving mobility clients and on different topics. And with that, let me hand over to Darius for our pitch on the micromobility city. Thank you very much, Kerstin. And I'm also very grateful and happy to be in this fantastic round. Um, a couple of words also on my side. Thank you, Horace, for the very kind introduction. 
I'm a specialist at McKinsey. I'm sort of say part of the McKinsey Center for Mutual Mobility since more than five years, spending my time on all topics around micro and shared mobility. Uh, have been in that space for even a bit longer. So yeah, very happy to give you a bit uh, on our insights and to share also so to see what we've done. And I would like to start uh, the agenda today with the micro mobility city. We also gonna talk about our, I would even call it now famous uh, market sizing, now specifically focusing on bicycles. And then we also gonna turn over to our consumers for any insights. Let me start with the micro mobility city and what may sound a bit like a very abstract acronym. The idea what we did behind here is we imagined a average European city, as we can see today. Think about a city such as Munich or such as Barcelona and ask ourselves what would happen if that's the city would on a large scale implement micro mobility, right? We would then talk about a city with a population of roughly 1.1 million inhabitants, an area surface of roughly 370 square kilometers, and a private car park of 520,000 vehicles. The mode split of that city is also what we typically see here uh, in Europe. Private cars, of course, dominating the mode split, making up roughly 71% of all passenger kilometers traveled, followed by public transit, 17%, and high quality around 11%. And what we did is we asked consumers of that specific city archetype how their willingness would be to replace a certain share of their private car trips by micro mobility. So what we asked, specifically now um, car owners, is considering the trip mix that you do today with a private car, how many of those private car trips do you imagine can you replace by micro mobility? And we found it very interesting that more than a fifth of all trips um, could be addressable by micro mobility, concretely 23%. A number which is, I think, quite impressive considering that's private car owners, right? It's not only those who don't have a car or who would consider themselves as multimodal users. It's specifically people who say, yes, I use and they own a private car in my typical daily mobility. Now, what we did is we then used this 23% and tried to understand how this mobility shift would impact certain environmental and also economical factors in that city. And we started with CO2 emissions. We tried to understand based on a reduction of car park of roughly 20%, which would be so to say the result of this 23% uh, trip addressability and found that such a shift would save CO2 emissions of more than 70,000 inhabitants of that city. We assume here roughly a CO2 emission per capita of seven tons per year. And I found this number quite striking because it's again only for one city. If you would now start to extrapolate that number to all similar sized cities, so to all cities such as Milan, such as Barcelona, such as uh, Munich, then the CO2 savings would accumulate more than uh, 4 million Europeans, right? So that's quite sizable. The second impact we try to understand is how much of the space that is currently used for parked vehicles could be, so to say, reclaimed because we take out a certain number of cars from the system and instead use bikes. And what we found is that such a European average city could reclaim roughly 1.4 square kilometers of space, which is, for your understanding, roughly the size of the Hyde Park in London, so quite sizable again. That number is even more interesting if you think about the fact that here we really only calculate with hard vehicles. If you would, of course, also consider the moving vehicles and the infrastructure behind that, that number, of course, would be much higher. What we found also interesting in that analysis is 
that on average, every part car consumes seven extra space uh, as compared to a product uh, park bicycle. The last analysis, what we did is we also looked at the savings in commuting time. We tried to understand per car driver who at least would replace a certain portion of his or her car trips. How much time would this person also save in terms of hours per year? And we found that this person could save 25 hours of commuting time. That's quite interesting because for instance, in Germany, every person spends roughly 40 hours in car commute traffic per year, right? So that's sort of say more than half of time sort of say spent and also saved. And now the very last analysis we did is we tried to understand how much money would somebody save who would again partially start to save on private car trips and instead start to use micro mobility. And we found that that person would on a yearly basis save roughly $1,400 in mobility spending. As compared again, this is more than half of all the mobility spendings that the European would save on average per year, namely $2,400. And of course comes from the fact that CCO, so life cycle cost of ownership of a private car are roughly eight times higher than that of a, of a bicycle. Here we of course include traditional and metric bikes. So we do believe, as you can see here, that there are a variety of factors also which are impacted on, so to say, abstract city level. And I would like to hand over again to Kerstin, who now talks, so to say, about hard facts and looks at the market sizing that we do day in, day out. Thank you, Dario. So from thought exper experiments a bit more to data, historic data, and a bit of a forecast, very much in uh, in tune with the times and in times with this uh, very, where we now today I read this morning that especially for or for Germany at least e-bikes are still going strong obviously not as strong as they were sort of pre the current situation but they're still selling strong and there is no um, uh, no trend for fewer e-bike sales despite all of the uncertainty that is at times in the market but looking a bit back uh, uh, more and at, at value pools and uh, taking a look at what we see there. So what we've done is we've looked at value pools for electric bicycles by region. And you can see that this is simply a, a sizable amount already. Europe, obviously, or Europe being the largest um, uh, market by far, China being uh, the second largest market in terms of value. If we were to look at volume here and take a look at number of vehicles sold, China would actually be number one by far. It's just a question that the average bicycle, the average electric bicycle in Europe is much more expensive than it is in, in China. And it's not only price so that it's charging a higher price, but the vehicles are also a bit more sophisticated, elaborated, and so on and so forth. And the US, um, and I think everybody who lives in the US will, will know that is, is simply a bit smaller still. It's not so much that individual markets or micro markets in the US are small. It's more that on overall, uh, if you take a look at and aggregate at the country, biking is simply not as proliferated yet, I have to say, hopefully, um, compared to other countries. Um, if we take this one, one step further and, and say, um uh where basically this is uh this is headed in our mind uh, i think we can we can go on to the next one darius um uh where where this is headed and then if we do take a look at uh, our uh, outlook for 2030 you can see that the growth is also sizable right so if we do take a look at uh, how the value pools are going to evolve until 2030 you can clearly see that um uh, uh, there's going to be sizable growth across all of the markets uh, China, Europe is going to stay in the leading um, uh, market when it comes to size. Uh, and then the US is actually the one, the market that is growing most strongly, however, off a quite small base to begin with. But nonetheless, we do see that growth. And I don't know yet, maybe the US might also prove us wrong and the growth is much more stronger. And actually, uh, uh, the US is catching up more strongly towards uh, China and Europe. I guess we'll we'll see about that, and I know that especially in this community, we're all working towards uh, making sure that this is happening and that the U.S. is actually becoming a much larger market than than it may look like at the moment. Um, when we then take a look a bit at consumer survey insights, because 
I mean, what people do is one thing, what people say is another thing, but we always try and combine the two. Uh, what we have done is, is we always take a look at how do people actually want to pay for their vehicle and are they into sharing, are they into um, uh, ownership, but we also do take a look at what people actually want in terms of a form factor. And as you can see here, the electric bicycle or the bicycle per se doesn't have to be electric is the most uh, preferred form factor across most geographies at least the single most preferred form factor. In the US, it's quite interesting that mopeds, kick scooters, and mini mobility combined are actually uh, higher than, uh, than the electric bicycle, uh, being the only country where that's the case. And you can also see that, um, um, that the patterns are a bit different, that some countries prefer micro sorry, mini mobility a bit more, scooters are more popular in some than others. Obviously, the south of Europe, so France and, and Italy, they are a bit more uh, used to e-mopeds than, say, Germany. Uh, but in principle, e-bike or bike and e-bike, number one, followed by the others. Just to point out one thing, mini mobility, so the small vehicles, the small cars, right? Vehicles basically somewhere between a cargo bike and a small vehicle, a small car, are actually quite popular, even though they're not heavily introduced in the market. So everybody knows what a bicycle is. I think by now, most people also know what an e-kick scooter is, but despite the fact that some people probably still don't know what a micro car would be and what mini mobility is, it's still quite popular. It's already quite popular, especially so in the US and China, because these are in some cases alternatives to a, a, a private vehicle or a car, a conventional car, if you will, but also in other geographies where these vehicles are still starting to be introduced in the market. And that's actually also one of the segments where we do believe that there's going to be a significant growth potential going forward. Um, then, as I said, we, we don't only look at preferred vehicle archetypes. Um, we've also asked the question, how do people actually want to pay for their vehicles? And in this case, um, we've, we've taken bicycles or e-bicycles, S-pedelecs and traditional bicycles. And what is quite interesting is that um, sort of the newer the vehicle and probably also the more expensive the vehicle, the more popular you have, uh, uh, you, the more popular and the more popularity you see for new ownership forms and types. Uh, so you can see leasing as one uh, interesting piece. You can see uh, subscription as interesting piece. You can see financing, but then also a usage of shared services that is quite high for electric bicycles and S-pedelecs compared to the traditional bicycle. And you can discuss why this is the case. I do believe that for leasing, subscription, and financing, there are mostly two reasons. One, it's a new technology, so there might be some uncertainty, and you might not want to bear the risk of actually owning the vehicle and then having to deal with the consequences. And then two, it's obviously also a thing of the total ticket size, so the price of the vehicle, because obviously a traditional bicycle is much more inexpensive uh, than a, an electric bicycle or an S-pedal leg. And then for the usage of shared services, I think it's, it's a question of availability. So most of the bike sharing schemes or many of the bike sharing schemes are now converting to electric bicycles. So that might be another reason why actually the shared service uh, use is, is higher there. Um, we then recently took a look at holding periods. So we asked people um, uh, where exactly or how long exactly they would like to keep a bicycle or keep a vehicle, an e-bicycle. And what you can see is there are a few patterns there. So two to three years is the most common holding period across all of the different geographies. Um, in, in general, you can also see that some people actually tend to hold their vehicles for quite a long time. So you have this six to seven years or basically more than six years uh, across a few, across a few uh, uh, folks. And there is also a large group of people that keep the bicycles or the e-bicycles for three years, four years, or even five years. So quite interestingly, in, in terms of the holding time, nonetheless, there is that group of people that say, I want to renew my vehicle every one to two years, or maybe even every single year. And with all these new ownership models, subscription and leasing coming into it, we do believe that the holding period will actually be shorter, simply given the way that there is a different financing mode. And this will actually open up a sizable secondary market, both for e-bicycles, for e but also other micro-mobility modes, simply because the residual value is higher and uh, some people will actually also have a chance to buy into the market in the secondary market because the uh, new value, the new uh, price of the vehicle might be too expensive. Um, we then looked at, uh, and this is data that is basically hot off the press, so we only uh, compiled the survey early this week, but we thought we would still introduce it here. And uh, as a quick uh, teaser towards the next webinar that we're going to have, 
uh, we're sharing some of this data. So in the next webinar, we're going to go super deep on uh, on our most recent bicycle and micro mobility survey, which again, like I said, has a 2024 date. So we uh, uh, only sort of compiled the data uh, today or actually yesterday. So what we're going to do next time is really go deep on many, many more questions that we ask people across the globe on usage of bicycles, buying behavior, preferred brands, and many other things. But here as a teaser, what you can see is we, we ask people, uh, how frequently do you use the bicycle? What is the distance per year? And then also what share is actually for commuting? So one of the questions we asked is, what are the use cases that you mostly use your bicycle for? And what you can see that's quite interesting is obviously an electric bicycle is used for longer distances than um, uh, than a traditional bicycle. An electric bicycle, at least in the US and Europe, is also used for more trips. Um, and this basically goes to show that the people that claim that an electric bicycle actually makes you healthier probably are right because you're simply biking more and you're exercising more. So therefore, even though you might have some support from the electric motor and the electric powertrain, for your health, it's actually good. And it's not only good for your health, it's obviously also good for the environment and for traffic because people are simply traveling longer distances. And then last but not least, we take took a look at the commuting share just to see is the bicycle something that is actually used for uh, to replace a private vehicle and is it really used for commuting purposes on a day-to-day -day basis, or is it more of a recreational vehicle? And unsurprisingly, in China, the share of commuting uh, folks is actually highest. So the primary use case of the bicycle is, um, uh, is for every second bicycle owner in China uh, uh, commuting. And then in, in Europe, you see a slightly higher share compared to the US also expectedly because of shorter distances and uh, different road patterns. But it found it, I found it still interesting, or we still found it interesting that one in four users in the US is actually using the bicycle primarily for commuting. And if we were to look at this only for electric bicycles, so not including con, uh, um, uh, commercial, sorry, conventional bicycles, the share would actually be much higher for all geographies, just as another teaser. So thank you so much for that. We've uh, covered all of the ground we wanted to cover here today. One last page, and uh, uh, Horace already mentioned it in his intro. So McKinsey is known for working with blue chip companies, Fortune 500 companies, and, and so on. But there is a group in McKinsey, and the Center for Future Mobility is very much a part of that group that enjoys working with companies that aren't there yet, but on, on their way to becoming unicorns, decacorns, or simply companies that are getting into the market now. We are extremely passionate about doing this. We are passionate about supporting companies in the internationalization, accelerating the scale up, and ultimately making sure that you don't only accelerate your business, but also increase the chances of being the next unicorn, the next decacorn, or whatever your aspiration is. Thank you so much for that. Very much looking forward to going into the Q&A part of the, of the webinar. And uh, I said it before, I'm going to say it again, this is not going to be the last webinar. We'll have another three this year. The next one is going to deal significantly with the findings from our bicycle survey. So if you're interested in that, uh, I think it's going to be sometime mid-June, so roughly the same date. Uh, looking forward to seeing you again there. And again, please do share your questions uh, now, and we're happy to answer them and have a lively debate. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. That was uh, highly, highly interesting, informative. I feel like I was taking a lot of screenshots myself. Um, I just wanted to give everyone uh, a heads up that we are going to be doing a Q&A. Uh, please feel free to drop your questions into the chat uh, using the Zoom tool. Uh, and questions for McKinsey, questions for Horace, um, you know, questions about the presentation, broader questions about the industry and the market. Uh, kind of everything is game. We've got another 35 minutes here. So we have plenty of time to get to all the questions you guys could possibly come up with, I think. So uh, prove me wrong <laughs> and maybe maybe we won't get to everybody, but uh, yeah, I would love to start to go through here. So maybe to begin, um, I see a question here. Let's go through the chat. Uh, let's start with a specific one about the deck maybe. Um, we got a couple of questions here about some of the figures and the stats that were cited. Um, this one from John on slide 10, can you explain how you got the $1,400 USD saved figure? What comprises the savings? So maybe uh, possible to look at that. Um, we're also happy to take broader questions, but I see a lot of questions specifically about the deck. So maybe let's start with those. Uh, Darius or Kirsten? 
why don't I take this loop? Happy to answer. And I think that's a very good question. And I think it also relates to the question I saw one on how we define the term value pools, right? So always when we talk about savings or value pools, we basically talk about the value pools across the entire value chain, right? So what we indeed include then are the savings from, so to say, owning the vehicle, operating the vehicle, including gas and, and, and electricity, and then up, of course, to all connectivity services and apps included. So that's, so to say, included in the savings of $1,400. I think Kirsten, there is another question also from uh, David. Um, how much is fear of battery failure a factor in ownership versus other ownership options? So let me, yeah, let me let me comment that I think the the whole battery failure topic, in terms of the batteries actually failing while I'm while I'm having the bicycle, I think that's a bit less of a concern. We have seen uh, as a concern the fact that um, uh, people say, hey, I don't know what the residual value is going to be and uh, how much this is going to affect it. And I'm not sure about how long the battery is actually lasting and whether the battery deteriorates too quickly. So it's a bit the same challenges that we also see with the conversion to electric vehicles. Um, however, in our mind, if we were to, to uh, ask sort of, or sort of assign percentages, how many people actually do the leasing or financing for the reason that the vehicle is quite expensive, or because there are simply very good offers in place to, uh, to pay for these vehicles in an alternative finance model, because as an example, in, in Germany, we have a thing called employee leasing for bicycles, where you can actually get a tax benefit if you lease a bicycle via your employee. And then it basically you're basically paying out of it from your uh, gross income, not your net income. So it has a significant impact. So uh, in, in our data, I would say at least 80% of the people that go for leasing do that because of the cost or the beneficial or the benefit that they have in terms of tax savings or others rather than going for it for a uh, battery risk or other other tech risks. So the amount, the price is much more of a reason than the technology. But yes, you're right. The technology is definitely is definitely a topic as well. There is, I think there is the first question from David on the 1.4 kilometer squared, uh, which I think is also on the deck to one of the questions. Maybe you want to take that one if that's OK. Absolutely. And as far as I understand the question um, is, what we size here is the freed up space only if you would replace parking cars, right? So um, out of a simplicity perspective, one, and then of course we do not believe that, so to say, there is a direct correlation between a reduction in private car park and then a reduction in, so to say, car lanes, right? So we kept it, so to say, a bit more conservative um, and found then the 1.4 square kilometers of, of, of space, of uh, gain space, quite reasonable. Um, and we do believe, and that's also why we are, so to say, so uh, optimistic about that, is that cities have a real in incentive, so to say, to really gain that space, right? May it be for green areas, may it be for parking spots. For instance, for my community itself, uh, we do see a couple of use cases, and then we sort of say leave it a bit open also for cities on how to decide what they would like to do with this uh, gain space. Amazing. Maybe I'll, I'll just go sort of keep going top to bottom to the question. So some uh, there was a comment from Marty that appreciated the content. Thank you for that. There was a question, is there a paper or a deck about this? So there is this deck that we can share. Uh, we have a paper on the micromobility city as well that we can share. There was an article we wrote, and there will be eventually also a paper on the latest bicycle survey and then also a deck for the next webinar, but also a paper or an article. We're still working on that, given that we just completed the uh, the survey, but there is going to be another publication on, on this. Um, there was a question on, have we seen available e-bike charging affecting bicycle e-bike sales? So... That's one of the most or the, the most significant differences in concerns when somebody is thinking about an electric vehicle, so a car from a conventional car and an ICE car, or um, uh, buying an electric bicycle. 
The charging is one of the biggest concerns when it comes to electric cars. It's much less of a concern when it comes to, um, uh, to e-bikes, simply because an e-bike is much easier to charge. Um, what we have seen, however, is if somebody is going for an e-bike, there is a secondary effect in the sense that the e-bike is more expensive and therefore people are more worried about theft or somebody damaging, so uh, vandalism damaging the bicycle. So they are more worried about where they can actually park the vehicle. So the e-bike uh, purchasing is affected by this parking thing much more than by the um, by the charging per se, because everybody seems to uh, have or be able to figure out a way. There is a difference between, uh, let's say, the US and other markets, given that we have seen and everybody has observed in the news that there have been some incidents and some fires due to battery charging. There seems to be less of a problem in other markets where the battery certification seems to be, uh, be a bit more strict. Uh, so it's also less of a concern in, in, in these markets. Um, Darius, um, you want to take one on uh, top three barriers to adoption of bicycle use in urban centers. I'll, uh, I might pile on after you. And I think yes, you already mentioned one very good point, right? So we often hear this sort of. So I think there is a difference, sort of say, in perceived versus actual uh, range anxiety, right? And indeed, for e-bikes, that's not one of the main reasons, but that's sort of say one of our top ten reasons. I think um, the, the main point when we ask consumers is definitely uh, the missing infrastructure, so bicycle lanes, right? Um, that is sort of say something which keeps consumers away of a higher e-bike adoption. Secondly, we also see definitely costs um, simply as one of the main points. Um, we have seen indeed cities, especially governments, trying to circumvent the problem by also incentivizing, especially uh, e-bike ownerships by granting purchase subsidies. Um, and these are typically the main two reasons. And then maybe a third reason, which often also comes up, is this, I would call it again, the perceived notion of safety or, or sort of say reduced safety, which uh, I believe um, is indeed for a couple of cities a point. And that's why also we so to say we're motivated to bring up this notion of how must the city look like in order to, to increase safety and to prevent more fatalities and injuries. And we do believe that the main so to say point here is to somehow segregate and separate car and also bike ridership and not to have this intermingling uh, that we can see in many cities. Thank you. I'll um, take the next one, which was uh, what sort of changes can cities make to accelerate a shift towards micro mobility? What are the biggest barriers to adoption? I think Darius, you already partially answered that, right? So I think for sure it is infrastructure, uh, getting an infrastructure that is safe to ride um, and safe to park the vehicles. One, two, I think it's not only a question of making cities more attractive for biking and micro mobility. I think it's also a question of making cities less attractive for car usage, because it is still in most cities much too convenient to use the private vehicle, to park the private vehicle, uh, and it's actually costing a lot of money um, for the public, basically, via taxes, uh, because lots of money is flowing into maintaining this infrastructure that could also go into, or that could be better used if it were uh, put into infrastructure for smaller vehicles. So finding different ways how to disincentivize car usage in cities is definitely a topic that um, uh, that would uh, that would also help with the adoption. So it's basically trying to attack the problem from both ends, making it more attractive, and then also frankly, making some of the alternatives a bit, a bit less attractive. Felix had um, a good, uh... Sorry, to jump in, uh, Christian. Felix had a good flip side to that question. You know, what are the potential drivers of growth of, uh, for micro mobility? You know, changes in user uh, attitude, um, infrastructure, incentives, things like that. I'm wondering. Well, I'd love to get all your takes on this horse as well. If, uh, if you have a thought there, um, you know, because I see a lot of questions about the barriers. It'd be great to hear. You know, what are some of the assumptions in your models about about uh, how this is going to accelerate? I'll start and then everybody else feel free to pile on, right? I think, Felix, you you got great ideas already there and it's it's very much that, right? So it's the push measures or basically any measure that is either 
passive aggressive or actively aggressive against cars that definitely makes a sense uh, the governmental incentive, I like that a lot on on sort of uh, tax reductions or finding ways for people to make bicycles more affordable. Honestly, I think the German model, and I might be biased here, is a good one where you can actually take a, a corporate bicycle or um, a, an empl a company bicycle, if you will. You can use it for uh, personal use as well. And then it's ultimately being deducted from your gross income, not your net income. So you're saving a lot of money on the bicycle. I think that's a fantastic incentive. I know other countries have similar things. I know that's one of the reasons why subscription services for bicycles are extremely popular in Paris. But I think any any kind of incentive that gets people or makes the, the transition more easy combined with an incentive that makes actually the, the car uh, uh, usage more complicated is definitely going in the right direction. But Darius, Horace, please feel free to pile on here. Yeah, let me just quickly uh, add one thought. Uh, the, a lot of, the, you know, when we, we talk about uh, change like this, dramatic change, it's usually a multi-causal um, uh, system. That is to say, there isn't one single thing. And um, it's easy to sort of say that it's because of something, but that's actually false. Um, it's many, many things. And that's what I think uh, we're, we're, we're uh, pointing out here is that these factors accelerate, uh, enable, uh, and are quote unquote key. Uh, there's one, there's many missing from this list. However, for example, it's simple product innovation. Uh, we, we can see a plethora of new vehicle types, new vehicle uh, designs, uh, innovation in terms of uh, technology itself, uh, connectivity and so on. And these have come to the sector and, uh, and uh, you cannot uh, be single, uh, there's a single key, I would argue. Um, but um, what's exciting is that more and more uh, across the board that there are people looking at it, as you as you point out, from government, from cities, and uh, and also uh, deciding uh, what is you know experimenting with and deciding what to do. Uh, so I, I'd say it's it's kind of a trap to say that oh there's a you know a silver bullet out there. I think it's an all all court uh, you know uh, press right now going on. Thank you, Horus. Darius, go ahead. I would actually continue because I see we have a couple of questions which are still open. I, I uh, think uh, somebody somebody said, let's take uh, Luke's word for it and try and make them fail to answer all of the questions. So <laughs> let's, let's go. <laughs> Darius, why don't you take the pick one? I, I, I saw a couple of questions also on the mini mobility space, right? And uh, thank you for that. Um, so how we define mini mobility is all L6 and L7 type of vehicles with three or four wheels uh, below 500 kilograms of gross vehicle weight, right? So we include, that was maybe like a very abstract definition, but what we include here are all types of quadricycles, uh, micro cars, and even golf carts. Golf carts, of course, would expand that uh, measure a bit. But for us, what is decisive here is that basically it covers the space between the conventional micro-mobility modes, so bicycles, mopeds, and e-scooters, and then on the other hand side, cars, right? And uh, I think we talked about that also in the last webinar. We are quite bold about that form factor because we believe it addresses the pain points of micro-mobility. You have more cargo space. It also protects you from... from specific weather conditions, but it also is able to address a large share of trips that are currently done with a private car. And that's sort of say um, the, the thinking behind that term and also our uh, very optimistic perspective. Pick one on form factor. So there is a question um, whether we think or why we think electric bicycles are more popular than electric scooters even though the scooter is smaller and more mobile and then tenders are being held. And I saw another question further down that said, um, uh, why is the fleet of electric scooters being reduced at all? And is this the influence of Paris? Let me let me take those together. So, um, for, so 
personally, and this is more of a slightly uh, uh, personally an emotion or borderline emotional answer, is I honestly don't understand. I don't understand why uh, an, a shared e-bike is more popular in the, in the sense of city authorities than a shared e-kick scooter, because I agree the form factor is more compact. Uh, it takes up less space um, and it's also uh, better suited for some use cases. Um, but there seems to be, and, and I think this can is probably routed in the fact that um, uh, this is a new form factor, so people are less used to it. So it's e always easier to start complaining about something that is new rather than something that's evolving. And ultimately, the e-bike is just an evolution of, of a bicycle. All of the or most of the e-kick scooter sharing schemes are free float. And then given that the vehicles are smaller, they're also probably a bit more in the way or considered to be a bit more in the way. And then they seem to be falling over more easily, which actually isn't 100% true, right? Because also shared e-bikes can fall over. But there's just a perception that these are in the way. Plus, I think quite openly, not all of the operators when they first launched a couple of years ago did a fantastic job in aligning this with the stakeholders. And some companies simply went ahead and uh, uh, dumped, quote unquote, some of these scooters in the city. So I think it's always a bit of way of, of, of how they went to the market. I think this hasn't completely vanished yet. Um, in my mind or in our mind, Paris, yes, has had an impact, but not the impact that some people were fearing that now multiple cities are going to say, no, we don't want shared e kick scooters. Um, I, my personal view is, I think we're going to need a combination. We're going to need a combination of shared e-kick scooters in cities, shared bikes in cities, because these serve different purposes and fulfill different use cases. Um, and just personally, I have to admit, I'm a big e-kick scooter fan because of the, uh, or because there is no requirement to exercise, because specifically when you're going somewhere where you don't want to show that you've been exercising, even if it's only an e-bike, right? It just makes you feel different. It makes you feel more comfortable to actually use this option. And personally, but this is again personal reflection for me, any city that doesn't have a shared e-kick scooter program is much harder for me to explore uh, because then you always have to find different ways. So I do think that the shared e-kick scooters are, are central to a city. And I also personally do hope that this is not going to be a, or that the ripple effect that hasn't happened yet from Paris is going to continue. I do think that regulating to a certain extent the way how many operators can be in a city, how many scooters can be in a city, what areas they're in, and then also where the riders can go, where they can't go, where there should be speed limits, where the vehicles can be parked, or in including uh, uh, virtual parking zones for these vehicles are all good things if done properly, right? And I think some cities are doing a better job than others. But I think we're still sort of finding ways to get to the to the real model or the to the end state, if you will, of the model how shared e-kick scooters can can work in cities. There just is... a quick oh, note. Sorry. First, sorry. Yeah. Uh, just I mean, this has been an ongoing debate for a long time. You know why scooter versus bike, um, and also um, you know a lot of this is very deeply rooted in psychology. Uh, we're not going to collect a lot of good data because what happens typically is people. Uh, who might have a grudge, who might be uh, cynical, who might be, uh, you know, simply uh, uncomfortable with this new technology will not say so. Um, what we saw with the referendum in, in Paris, however, is that it does skew very much towards the elderly voting against something like this. And that's very typical for any technology adoption, is that the laggards are, tend to be older. Um, it's much more uh, a young person's uh, tool right now. Uh, we can address that over time. But at, th at this point, and, and, you know, we, we do have a backlash from those who are feeling left out of this uh, revolution. Um, don't forget, by the way, that in, in Paris, only 8% of the eligible voters voted. Um, and it was it was by no means a plurality of people against this. In fact, I would argue uh, um, the ben main beneficiaries were even tourists who have no voice in um, in Paris as, as voters. So uh, let's not read too much into uh, some of the early data or uh, supposed data on, on preferences here. Um, any technology is going to suffer from uh, this kind of uh, laggard uh, resistance, but also hostility. So let's, uh, you know, given time, uh, things will transition. And on that, picking that up, in our recent survey that we just did, we also asked people uh, or identified personas in patterns of adoption of any kind of new mobility. 
And what Horace was saying about laggards is 100% true. So there is basically, if you will, I don't want to say society is split, right? But you can clearly see a difference, a complete difference in usage of any kind of new mobility. Doesn't matter if it's electric cars, if it's shared mobility, if it's micro mobility, between those people that have already started using them and those who haven't. Um, and it, it it holds true for everything. So an electric vehicle, an electric car owner is much more likely to use shared mobility and to also have an electric bicycle than somebody who hasn't yet shifted. And uh, in our mind, we will continue to see this trend that there are a few people that change their mobility behavior, that are extremely open to it, and then a few others that simply aren't. And I think converting that, those laggards, that's another story, right? But, but the beauty is, or the good news is, there is a sizable group of people that have started changing their behavior and are very much looking forward to continue to doing that. And there is a strong correlation, I have to say, to age, uh, to where they live. So everybody who lives in an urban environment is much more likely to use any kind of form of new mobility than any than anybody else. There is also a link to education, uh, and there is also, in some cases, it's not a 100% a pattern, but a link to income. So obviously, it's also easier to afford uh, changing mobility if you have a higher income, right? But I think the, the uh, pattern of urban, educated, and young is a very clear pattern when you think about mobility usage and how patterns are changing. Darius, pick one at random or pick one that you like most because I, I doubt we're gonna get through all of them. <laughs> uh, I think we have a couple of questions on the supply side, right? Uh, and indeed we talk a lot about the demand side, about consumer demand. And I think we have a couple of questions uh, making the point of, what does it need to take also from a supply, from a city, I would say, supply south now to also foster my community? And I think maybe as a people, we need to understand that also if you look at how cities regulated my community in the last, let's say, three, four years, specifically during COVID, is they try to have more ownership of what is happening on their streets, right? Which is not necessarily a bad point. And I think what is happening at the moment, cities such as Paris, for instance, trying to disincentivize private car usership and instead setting up like charging racks for, for bikes, or you go even to US cities, you look at, uh, or so to say, North American cities, to Montreal, to Seattle, where you can see that even those cities, which so to say traditionally haven't been the number one micro cities in this world, have now also set up at least pop-up bike lanes, you can see that there is a certain movement also in how cities think about uh, bike mobility. And what we have also seen is that um, there is a clear incentive also for cities trying to, so to say, organize and get the especially shared micro space at stake, right? There is no interest of cities uh, to sort of say have like vehicles laying around to annoy pedestrians. There is a clear indication that cities want my quality for the reasons we talked about before, CO2 emission reduction, congestion reduction, and so on and so forth. But there is a clear tendency also that there is more of a push on the supply side than we currently even see. And that's also sort of say what in the end drives uh, the market sizes, which I guess in, uh, I want to pick up a few questions on the, so I think there are two questions, at least on the whole point of secondary e-bike market. Um, so I think this one is, and how it's emerging, if it's emerging, any, any thoughts and so on. I think today this market is still very much early stage. Why? Um, because one, we don't have a lot of e-bikes that are sort of two, three, four years old and are coming up for sale again. Two, because traditionally the secondary bike market is basically a classifieds market, right? Or a flea market market. So it's not very professionalized. Mm. Uh, and the value, the increasing value of e-bikes is now pushing this up. What we also see in most leasing schemes is that the rate of people that actually keep the vehicle after leasing, at least in, in Europe, is extremely high. So... Um, one data point for Germany specifically in the leasing schemes we have, the share of people that keeps the bicycle is 98% and the 2% that don't keep it uh, had had their bicycle stolen or vandalized or it broke, right? So there is almost nobody who actually returns wow. it. 
So that isn't happening yet. However, we do believe that one, if sort of real leasing schemes are introduced, um, and if this happens more at scale and more vehicles are being pushed into the market, and especially those of the 5,000 or 4,000 euro kind of variety, there will be a secondary market. And how will that work? I, I don't have a crystal ball really, right? But I would assume it will be a bit like uh, uh, online markets, places uh, that you see already for used cars. Uh, and it might also be that the uh, bike dealerships are going to get into this and, and see this as part of the professionalization of the dealership industry, see this as a valuable secondary stream, especially mm -hmm. because they can also do refurbishing and then get into the service piece of it. But it is still a bit, I want to say, speculation uh, because it's still very, very early stage. Yeah, just note, uh, same thing happened with the phone industry. Um... We, we we had a, a very late development of the secondary market, but it has become substantial uh, as the lifespan of the uh, of the of the devices has extended beyond two three years, and uh, um, and, and 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 that's fascinating uh, dynamic there. And I I, I would uh, suggest uh, also that the automotive probably took its time uh, early days of automotive that probably wasn't the used used car market so much. Um, and things were fragile back then, but still, you know, uh, that's how things go. 100%. Darius, you want to pick another one? I uh, saw a couple of questions also looking at the B2B space, uh, and if you have perspectives on that. So I thought the answer is yes, we do. Um, as Kirsten said, so we just initiated the survey and also got the results already specifically looking at bikes and then sort of say the specific sub-segments, uh, traditional bikes, e-bikes, cargo bikes. Um, in a very short sentence, um, we also have more and more conversations with uh, people around that sector because there is a clear use case for especially cargo bikes. If you think about the last mile delivery use case, it's simply cheaper and also more convenient alternative to what we see at the moment out there. I mean, I'm based in Munich and even in our city, um, we have seen tremendous traction for the typical cargo bikes um, from, from our sort of say very common parcel delivery services here. And, and therefore, yes, so we will be definitely doing something on that also and stay tuned for the second webinar when we talk specifically about um, e-bikes and also cargo bikes. Let me pick up uh, a question around, um, sorry, there was a question around how, how to encourage or what are factors that encourage people to buy versus use shared platforms. Um, we, we have looked at that. I think it's it's two main reasons. One is availability. So the fact that you simply always want to have your vehicle available whenever you want to use it. So a bit like a car, right? Why don't people do car sharing? Because they feel that there is lack of availability. And then the counter argument is always, I don't want to have to worry about the vehicle once I've parked it. And um, the key question is really the trade-off for many folks is, is there sufficient availability in the sharing schemes? versus um, uh, can I like, do I need my own bicycle or uh, do I need to own my own bicycle in order to be able to rely on it for everyday use? Um, we also see a lot of personas that actually complement. So we have people that are sharing only, we have people that are ownership only, and then people that complement. So they have their own vehicle and then they use sharing to complement in certain types of trips. Um, so for example, they want to go somewhere and then take a walk from there and then take maybe another vehicle for the ride home, something like that, right? That's that's definitely one where we see lots of complementing or also with different form factors. So people might use a bicycle for certain trips and then might use a shared e-scooters for others or vice versa. Um, uh, so there's complementing and quite openly, it's very much a used kind of behavior. So, or a, a, a behavior that's a learned behavior because bicycles have been around forever. And especially in Europe, when we take a look at uh, uh, households, everybody as a kid has a bicycle every Almost all, also many adults have a bicycle somewhere in the household, and it's very much a used or learned behavior that you actually have this at your own disposal, and it's there also because the cost relative to a car is just much, much lower. So that's one of the reasons why we also believe many people uh, have that preference and will always continue to have it. We also, by the way, um, believe in a quote-unquote portfolio approach so that people who are true micromobility households will have not only one micromobility vehicle in the household, but multiple, either different types of e-bikes, 
an e-bike, a cargo, an e-cargo bike, for example, but then also a scooter for certain distances, and they might then even complement to top it off uh, with sharing vehicles. Um, I saw one question on let me on on public space. So Daniel was asking. There was a message from McKinsey that car ownership is growing while the use is declining. Is that not taking more public space for parking than returning? So yes, uh, that's unfortunately the case. Um, and we had a long debate, McKinsey, internally on whether these numbers, one, whether we should publish them. And they're not our data. They're official data from the German government. And it was a, an analysis for Germany, where basically we saw that total kilometers traveled have declined significantly. They also declined for cars. And they were growing quite sizably for micro mobility, and they were growing quite sizably for walking as well. And we had a, a long debate whether the fact that uh, uh, there are still more cars out there, and actually when you look at the modal mix because of the total decline in kilometers and a significant decline in public transit, the car is actually gaining relevance in the modal mix. Whether this is a, whether we should publish this or not, in my mind, it's a good thing. So there's a good thing that people are using the car less and driving less. And people are walking more and are using bicycles or other micromobility form factors more. It's not good news that people are using public transit less, but that's a different story. Um, mm -hmm. The question on, on vehicles is, in my mind, the way how the human psychology, and I'm by no means an expert on human psychology, but the way how it works is, it will take time for people to realize that they're actually overpaying for the car because they're using it way too much. Uh, sorry, way too little and much less than before. And this will take time. So for somebody to buy an e-bike, that's an easy step. And then using that e-bike almost on a daily basis, that's also a fairly easy step. But then realizing that the car that you're paying maybe a monthly lease for or that, that you bought a couple of years ago that you're not using it, but still the costs are racking up, that will take time for people to realize that and then really make that decision to get rid of the car. So my journey towards not having a car anymore was actually quite influenced by the fact <laughs> that uh, uh, the car was simply there, right? And and it was used in learned behavior, but I had to change it at a certain point in time. I mean, I, I did that, yeah. But Horace, you wanted to weigh in here. Yeah, just a quick, again, I, I encourage people to think about what happened to computers. Uh, the computer is a wonderful tool, and I'm using one right now. Uh, there's 1.2 billion, about the same as the number of cars in the world. But when we got smartphones and then tablets and then wearables, uh, the market expanded uh, in parallel to the uh, existing form factor. But what happened is typically that the small devices were being uh, used in shorter intervals. This is exactly the same as micromobility in terms of trip distance. But more so, uh, they steal usage. So like a phone uh, is not going to substitute for spreadsheets, but it's going to substitute for some communications. You're less likely to use your computer for instant messages, which was a very important use case back in about the year 2000, people were IMing each other. So using a computer as texting, essentially, and that moved to phones. And then we added usage in terms of, for example, social media, uh, photography, and uh, um, uh, uh, this sort of like a, a glanceable type of information. So. It, history is repeating itself, or at least rhyming. The, the logic of mobility is that you have a single device that tends to do a lot of things, but maybe not optimized for all those things. So when an alternative appears, people will use it in parallel and slowly transition their usage. That doesn't mean that the market for computers necessarily evaporates, but what happens is that the amount of minutes on computers starts to decrease, and then the, that computer stays in use longer, and it doesn't get as much replacement. And that's certainly, we're seeing that with, with PCs today. And I think the car will end up in a similar situation where it gets more garage time, and as a result, it, people will simply not not uh, change it as often, and that will impact the automotive market overall. And then people will realize, yeah, I'm paying a lot of for that option, which I'm not utilizing as much. Thanks for that analogy, Horace. That was a really interesting way to think about the computer, the car, the phone, the, the phone, the micro device. I think that's a really interesting, interesting kind of thing for us to take away and noodle on a little more. It's just a, a, a technological, technological precedent that has a lot of applicability to some of the things we talked about today. Um, I realize we're at or actually a little past time. Um, 
I also realized that I, I said we'd get to all the questions and uh, you all proved me wrong. There's, uh, this is probably the liveliest Q and A we've ever had um, with dozens of questions being asked. So I wanna make sure that the people in the webinar who've attended today, thank you for being here, uh, know where to get in touch with us in case they have other questions. So maybe um, on that note, uh, Kirsten, Darius, what would be the best way for people to get in touch if they wanted to learn more about the presentation or your work? Feel free to ping us on LinkedIn. That's probably the easiest way. And then uh, there is also, if you're looking at uh, uh, more research and so on, there is a McKinsey slash MCFM website. So if you Google McKinsey Center for Future Mobility, you'll get to that. You can also uh, 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 go there. But if there is a question about our content, feel free to ping either one of us on LinkedIn. Uh, we're usually quite responsive, probably not as quickly as uh, here, but uh, very much uh, appreciated that you asked all these questions and very sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. Yeah, and thank you for, for being here and for sharing some of this insight. And we're excited to continue to do this. As, as Kirsten alluded earlier, we're going to be doing a quarterly uh, webinar series for the full year. The next one will be in June, and it'll focus on some of the more exciting uh, research that McKinsey is putting out around bicycle usage, which I think will be really awesome. And hopefully we'll be able to tease some of that in the in the lead up to that event. So keep your, keep your eyes peeled on our newsletter and our social channels for the announcement there. Uh, thank you both for being here. Thank you, Horace, for being here too. Horace, your thoughts were always invaluable. And actually, it's... Webinar was going on, Horace and I were texting and saying that we should do a Q&A FAQ to answer all these questions. So maybe Horace will do a blog post after this to uh, to uh, to answer some of the questions we didn't get to. Uh, because again, I think there's just so such a wealth of content here and so many great ideas coming from the community in the chat. So thanks everyone for being here. Thank you for our guests. Thank you for our speakers. Thank you, Horace, Kirsten, Darius. Um, have a great rest of your day and we will see you on our next webinar in June. Amazing. Thanks everyone.